Hey everybody, welcome back to Nuvi News channel and today we're looking to security issues that were reported in VJS. Of course, they're already fixed and it's closed. We see how severe they are, what they actually do and we even try it out ourselves. Here we go. In the last month, the Wii team published four new CVEs, so reports around security vulnerabilities and of course also fixes with them. So we look into four of them and also take one from January, so that was published quite a bit ago because that's also quite relevant. And as mentioned in the intro, see how severe they are, what kind of applications they target, if any, what there are some conditions. And as mentioned, we will also try one out ourselves by using a version that's not patched. So big disclaimer here, first of all, I am no security researcher or expert. I'm just a JavaScript developer, like probably you are as well, but uh, luckily all these CVs are very well documented and it's great to understand them. The link to all of them is also below, so you can have a look into all of them uh, and see all the details as well, if the short summary is not enough for you. And also, as mentioned before, they are all fixed already, so please make sure you update to the latest version if you use Vite, or also if you use a meta framework based on Vite and don't have Vite as a direct dependency, you can still make sure that's updated by refreshing your log file or even use package overrides, which I've talked about recently as well in the video. So check it out if you're not aware of that. Before we dive into the details, there's one more thing I want to mention, and it's important that this is only an issue for the dev server. So all the five CVEs we have a look at, they only target the dev server. There is no problem in production, which doesn't mean you shouldn't update. It just means that your prod is fine. But we all run dev servers, right? So you don't want to be somehow uh, attacked by a malicious entity and get your source code stolen or maybe um, they access any kind of files on your computer without you noticing because this is all what would be possible for these CVEs if they're exploited. Okay, let's get into the first one and uh, see the details. The first one, as mentioned before, was published at the end of January and it's about that any websites were able to send any requests to the development server and can read the response. Now, in a way that sounds like, yeah, sure, no problem. I mean, it's a development server, you can test things, why not? But there is a big implication with that and there are quite some problems around this. The details of the CVE clearly explain three causes that in the end allows any kind of website or some malicious ones to send any request to development server. And we'll see why this is a problem. The first one are the good old course settings. And I know what you think. Course, maybe you're familiar with it and like, ah, oh, it's always annoying. I always set the headers to it's fine. Give me everything or just set up a proxy. Not the topic, but it's very important, especially in that context. But especially in the case of a dev server, it's very important that not any random website could just request JavaScript files and then read the content. Because usually this is prohibited thanks to the same origin policy. But if you set course headers by default that say, hey, everyone is allowed in here, then you can get that. That's also what's outlined here. The second part is a bit more tricky. It is about WebSocket connections, and that's what we'll try later on, and basically say, okay, malicious sites can hook into WebSocket connections easily and then get all the HMR information through the WebSocket. So whenever people change things, that could be debug codes, that could be maybe API keys that it has, so that wouldn't be great. And last but not least, there is no validation on the host header for HTTPS requests, which means, and that's also a tricky part, you could, in theory, do something called DNS rebinding attacks. So think about that. You access a malicious website and programmatically that website's DNS is then not pointing to where the website is, but surprise to localhost. And because the host header is not validated, then, well, it would just access your files as if it would be your localhost and then could send them anywhere, which in the end means access to all your files that the dev server serves. Not ideal. So these were the three parts of the CVE that were in the end leading to malicious websites, possibly getting the code from your dev server running. If you don't run a dev server, nothing happens. But here's also another important detail that's also mentioned in the CVE, which is that this vulnerability is even relevant if you run the VDEV server on your local machine and even if you do not expose it to the network. So that's very common to the other CVEs we'll have a look because even if you just say, okay, it's on my local machine, as long as you have a connection to a malicious website, you can have some troubles and that's not good, of course. So regarding mitigation, what happened? Of course, first of all, the things were patched, which is great. And you can see the versions that were affected and the versions that were patched in the CVE itself. But of course, also here. So everything uh, greater than 609 and of course, also everything that is uh, beyond 5.4.12 and 4.5.6. So of course, we see also 
backwards patches for all three major versions here, 6, 5, and 4. Great. So what happened here? Well, the mitigation is the following. There are also strategies to do it without upgrading, and there's also an upgrade path aligned. You can get into that if you're interested. But the easiest way, especially with the new versions, is this. Server.AllowedHosts. That's a new configuration, and if you work with some kind of reverse proxy or have to expose your uh, dev server to a network or do some kind of host manipulation, then you might be aware of that already, and I've already said that. So the idea is that you now say, okay, here are the domains that are actually relevant for Veed and that Veed is allowed to respond to. Otherwise, no way. When you use HTTPS, this is skipped. That's fine because um, the host validation that we've seen before is only relevant when you do HTTP requests, which is the default, right? And in the end, localhost and .localhost, so any subdomains, they're included, but otherwise you have to include domains yourself. You can do it through an end variable, you can set it down here, or through the configs. And if you wonder, okay, which domain should you add? Well, the domains you own, if you want to, and the domains that are relevant to your website. But of course, not just like any random domain and don't set it to just true because then, well, you basically open the gate again for that security vulnerability. And now I might wonder, okay, how likely is it that people abuse that in a way? Hard to tell. I mean, if you have malicious websites and now almost every framework is based on Veed, maybe even some kind of spear phishing attack where people directly um, target developers of a certain company, let's say a bank or whatnot, there are chances. Do we have uh, anything out there that says, oh, well, I was, uh, I don't know, I was a victim of that attack. I haven't found anything around that. that. That didn't mean it didn't happen. And most importantly, it's great that it's fixed and reported. So kudos to all the people for all the CVEs who take a look at this video who reported that with a responsible disclosure. So basically telling the team for the process, they fixed it, then they publish it. There is security researchers gets credits and um, everybody is safe, so to say. Anyway, if you're curious now how such an attack would actually work, we can have a look into that because well, I've prepared a little example based on also what's in the CVE report that does one of the three parts that were shown there, which is hooking into the WebSockets. So let's have a look. We'll start with the plain Vite and View starter template, which is really just that, that comes out pmpm create Vite and then run the View one. And we have a second tab open actually, which is, surprise, it's just this. It is hosted on a Cloudflare tunnel URL. It could be any website, so it doesn't need to be local. Well, that would defeat the purpose, right? This can be anywhere. You can refresh that, it still works, and it says type connected. Now, we'll also look into code in a bit. And as mentioned, this CV is fixed. We'll have a look why this still works here. Anyway, let's dive into code and see what is happening. Living here in our wonderful Vite view example, it is very important to note, as said before, we use Vite 600, so in version that's affected, you should definitely upgrade if you still use a lower version because, well, these are only patch versions. <laughs> Nothing should break in theory, right? Even for five and four as well. And we just have our wonderful, well, code here. And what we can do is we can just change code. Fine, we'll save that. And now we jump back into the browser. And here we see count to zero. We can click here, that works. And if we jump to our tab now, then we see, oh, type custom events, a file changed and the file itself. So now we have information around that. And also see, okay, does the accepted path, well, HMR information. Because what is happening here on the hood, we can look into that in the page source. This is all the code that's needed, right? Actually, just this part. We basically say, make a new WebSocket connection to our Veed server, right, on localhost. And as I said, this is actually running on an actual domain. So that works. We hook into the Veed HMR and just says, let's log that. And of course, malicious sites, we just send that somewhere else and so on and so on. And if you say now, okay, but look, this is just file names. Yeah, that's true. That's correct. So far it's just file names. But what if we do something like that? Let's do this. Oh, an error, right? Which would never happen to me in development that I have some invalid syntax and save the file. <laughs> Let's check the browser. And here we go. We, let me, let me zoom in a bit. We have this, a lot of things here. But basically, it's the error stack trace. And this is more or less also what we would see, not only in our lovely actual application, like, oh yeah, you have an error here, there's a problem. This is uh, more or less the information, but a bit more beautified, the stack trace. So from here, you get actually parts of the source code. And as I said before, this is not even related to some kind of DNS rebinding attack, something more complex. This is just that. And you get all the updates as long as the connection to its site is open. So maybe, when you look for help on some dubious website, 
and this is uh, scripted was ejected through like cross-site scripting or whatnot, that could get all your information here. So as I said before, the easiest way is just updating because it's fixed. And that is what we'll do now. We'll just update, reinstall dependencies and see what uh, will happen then. And all you see is a black screen. Now, if we actually open the dev tools, we will see why. Well, the browser can't establish a connection to the, the HMR server anymore. And it's not because I changed the port. Well, not at all. This is still here. And the connection, if you also refresh that, use WebSockets here, we still have this. But of course, now it is protected. Great. So that was quite an easy fix for us, right? Especially if you don't use any domains that you uh, need to, that actually need access or need to alias you're all good. Otherwise, you can use the option that we've seen before. Okay, now that we checked the big CVE that was published in January, what is with the four other ones that were published in the last weeks? Let's check them out and see what they're about. All right, the first one published three weeks ago, server.fs.tni bypassed when using question mark raw question question mark. It is a moderate severity given on the CVSS v3 base metrics. Well, they are at least an indicator if it's moderate for you or not, it always depends what you're doing. But here, the idea is that the content of arbitrary files can be returned to the browser. That's not ideal, because obviously you don't want like all your files on your computer being accessible by some malicious website. But there's a catch. And the catch is that this only would work if your app actually exposes your VDEF server to the network. So use dash dash host or server dash dot host as config option. And the idea is that we have this server FS deny part where you say, okay, look, there are files you shouldn't be able to access. This was like handled, I think, years ago to actually make sure that this isn't a problem. So not all the files are exposed when using the dev server. But of course, people always find clever ways to circumvent certain protection mechanisms. And so is it in this case, right? AdFS denies access to files outside of Veed serving a lot list. Makes sense. But if you use question mark raw question question or question import and raw question question, well, then this is in the end, reversed, right? No limits anymore, and that's because of the training separators. They're removed in several places, but not accounted for in query string rag access. You can easily test that. Like, technically, you can run these commands and say, hey, I get a top secret content. We can even do it ourselves when we have that uh, non-fixed Vite version, and then just do a curl. And ideally, you would see, okay, hey, that doesn't work. It's outside of the list, right? The server should not be able to serve this. But realistically, if you use the import raw, that served. Not ideal, because as we said before, then you could just get all kinds of different files from the file system, which you really don't want to. Now, how relevant is that CVE for you? Well, first of all, if you never expose your dev server, then you're not targeted. Also, as mentioned before, only dev, no production. That means if you do expose your server, though, well, you want to make sure you upgrade it as well. Also here, chance that is abused, Nobody knows, but um, especially for targeted attacks, that could be very, very helpful. And accessing arbitrary files, even though you can't like write to them, but read them, is no fun. So I understand why this is moderate. But as said before, for production apps, not a problem. And the same is also the case with all the other three CVAs that we'll see now. Because the next one is server.fs.deny bypassed for inline and raw with question import query. So as I see, you've seen a pattern here. Same idea, more or less, only exposing the Vite server actually to network will make your app vulnerable to that. And using one of the non-patched versions, they're also listed here, that also in the end works in a very similar way, just with a different attack vector. And you can also test the whole thing. Same problem was fixed. What is with the other CVE? We have two more left. And the next one, ha, you guessed that server FS denied bypassed with .svg or relative paths. So, a similar problem, you can access all the things from the different device by using, well, in this case, a little bit more of a strategy by using question mark to SVG, like with maybe also wasn't in it, or another header, that's it. Here, you had the limit that the file must be smaller than the asset inline limit, right? That's fine, sure, not a problem, but uh, that's, that's the whole story. So you can, for example, access once again temporary content with just adding these parameters. Not ideal, and the same applies as before. And now we get to the last one, and I know you already expect what's coming. Correct, server FS deny bypassed with an invalid request target. And here we go, that's also a clever way of doing this. In request target, the hash sign is not allowed. So you can still send a request, but of course it's not valid, and then 
Well, you can use relative paths to maybe access any kind of file. Also a problem, once again, only if you actually expose the whole thing into the network. And here there's one more thing. If you do not use Dino, well, then it's not a problem, but that's actually because Dino is sanitizing the requests directly. So they're not rejected or anything, but they're passed on, but the hash is not part of it anymore. And uh, that's it. So these were the four recent uh, CVEs that were published. And of course, the bigger one with the server.lau house that we've taken a look earlier. And now you might wonder once again, what does it mean that there are so many CVEs published recently? Well, first of all, it means that the V team is taking their job in terms of security very seriously and evaluating all the reports coming in, checking with severity and how to mitigate that. Because even though you might not expose your VDEF server to the network, there are setups where this is not only necessary, but common. And then you don't want to be a possible a victim of some kind of malicious website that then steals not only your source code, but actually any kind of files, that would be a problem. And um, well, in this case, is it a big issue for you or for the average web developer? Probably not. Is it still good that it's fixed? Absolutely. We don't want security vulnerabilities in, in Veed. So while people might wonder, oh, okay, is this like a sign of Veed being not secure enough? No, these are all like quite some edge cases that need a certain level and are only there for the dev server. But it is really good that first of all, as mentioned before, people check and report and that these are fixed. So we all have a more secure development server. And that's it for this video. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below. I'm really curious uh, if you, for example, like that little deep dive into the CVEs, if you feel a bit well, more secure now when using Weed, because you should, they're doing a phenomenal job. Shout out to uh, all the people involved there. Uh, and um, last but not least, check out the Deja View episode. Well, I'll talk with uh, James from the E18E initiative. So it's also something quite framework agnostic and a great thing. Uh, have a look and a listen, especially. Other than that, take a look at the older videos, the linked ones, and see you all soon. Happy hacking. <laughs>